Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Sunday morning worship for Kingmoor and Houghton Parish Churches. And uh, we trust you'd have a blessed time with us this morning. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, uh, says this, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we worship together in order to lay hold of and uh, to draw on that grace that is ours in Christ Jesus, but also that we may be strengthened by the grip of his peace in our lives in these difficult and challenging days. We start with uh, worship and uh, we reflect on who has held the oceans in his hands, who has numbered every grain of sand. God, eternal, humbled to the grave, Jesus, Saviour, risen now to reign. So behold our God seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. From 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2 to 9. The words will appear on the screen. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be holy together with all those everywhere, who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Jesus Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking, and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord is faithful. Yes, yes, I'll order a takeaway, please. I'll have a cheeseburger. Wait, I'll have three double cheeseburgers, three large fries, and yes, yes, three large milkshakes. Boys, what would you like? Oh! Welcome to the Barnsley Better Than The News Bulletin. Today's headline story you've just heard read is that the Corinthians from the area of... of Corinth have received a letter from none other than the man himself... Oh yes, the Apostle Paul. We at Barnsley Better Than The News Bulletin have managed to fly in two Corinthian citizens to interview them about their reactions. This is a world exclusive. Hello Corinthian 1 and hello Corinthian 2. How do you feel about receiving a letter from Paul? I know the answer. Excited, yes. <laughs> What's it like to get a letter saying he's encouraged by your faith? No, the answer is wonderful, of course. Paul's letter says you've been enriched in your knowledge. How does that make you feel? Don't tell me. Amazing, I know. The letter actually says that God will sustain you and make sure that you are blameless. How does that work? Wait, I know this too. It is because God is faithful. Although, I'm not sure what sustains means. Oh yes, he will look after you until the Lord returns. <laughs> well, that's all we have time for. Our next news segment focuses on how Paul's letter about God sustaining us affects people, Christians today. Over to our news correspondent in the other studio. Uh, no, I'm not in the studio. I'm actually... Oh wait, yes! I am in the studio, you've got it right this time. Well done. <laughs> well, the Corinthians were definitely encouraged by Paul's thanksgiving prayer, and it reminded them that they were enriched in the Lord. But I've been asking Christians in Carlisle if they are still feeling sustained by the Lord Jesus. Roll VT. Moustache man, do you still feel sustained by the Lord? Well, yes, I am encouraged because I am enriched in the knowledge of Jesus. I know that he has saved me. Good day. Hello. Hello, beardy man. Do you still feel sustained by the Lord? Yes, Paul's letter encourages me because it says that I have God's help when I speak to others about Jesus. Hello, glasses man. Do you still feel sustained by the Lord? Yes, I am encouraged because the letter reminds me that even though I still get things wrong and find things hard, Jesus will still present me as sinless because I am a Christian. Thank you. Eyebrow man, do you still feel sustained by the Lord? Yes, because Paul's letter says God is faithful to the end. 
And finally... Yes? Shower Cat Man! Do you still feel sustained by the Lord? Well, I am encouraged because I now know what sustained means. It means that God has provided and will continue to provide everything I need. Thank you. So, there you have it. Paul encouraged the Corinthians by giving thanks for their faith and reminding them of the gifts they had from God. And we're reminded that God will sustain us to the end too. We should remind each other of these truths during tough times and good times. God will always be with us and he gives us gifts that will help us to the end. Back to you in the studio. Yes, thank you to our roving reporter, Jenny. To sum up, um, how does Paul's Thanksgiving hair, whoop, whoop, uh, how does Paul's Thanksgiving prayer help us today? Yes, that's right. We're reminded that we are like the Corinthians. Oh yes, yes, we are enriched in Jesus and he will, he will keep us safe to the end. Well, thank you for watching and I'd like to wish you all a very good morning. Or good night. Come on, Mr. Kittens, we're leaving. First of all, in Church Family News, it's great to be encouraged, isn't it? One of the privileges for me as Vicar of Hound and Kingmore is to hear every day almost amazing things that Christians are doing out of love for Jesus and love for other people. So I've been aware all these weeks that although the church buildings are empty, the church is hugely active. The church has not been in lockdown at all. The church has been active in prayer, in love, in compassion, in giving, in serving, in all sorts of ways. And almost every day it's a great encouragement to see these things and hear about these things. And what a joy to be part of that community, Jesus' great community on earth. So do be encouraged as the church keeps on being the church and do keep up those good works. Uh, keep on phoning people and looking after them, praying and helping and serving. It's a great thing to do for Jesus' sake. And do be in touch if you'd like a copy of Mark's Gospel that we're reading through, or perhaps we could give you a couple and you might think of someone you'd like to give one away to. And the same for our crossings that came out a week or so ago. If you live outside the parish and you'd like one, just let us know, we'll put it in the post for you. Or why not have 10 and pray for a couple of friends that you might give one to and uh, invite them to say what they think about the Vicar's Letter and the other um, aspects of that publication. So if you'd like some of those, please just let the office know on the phone or on the email and we can very happily get them to you. And then just a word about all the different changes that we keep on hearing day in, day out uh, from the government, all the different updates that, that we all feel bombarded by at times. Just to encourage you that as a staff team and as a PCC, uh, we keep on monitoring them carefully, uh, the national guidelines from the government, the national guidelines from the Church of England, as well as the local guidelines from Carlisle Diocese. Uh, we're keen not to make any knee-jerk reactions, and just because something becomes possible doesn't mean we're urgently going to do it. Our conviction here is that we need to love Christ and make him known. We're really clear on our ministry and our strategy, and as and when, things we're allowed to do fit in with what we desire to do, then when we can do the risk assessments and check that we're being wise with time and energy and resources, then of course we'll do them. And we'll let you know, you'll get a vicar's letter, you'll hear it on Church Family News. So please don't worry, we're keeping a careful eye on things, but our desire is to do what's wise and safe with good stewardship to take forward ministry in these parishes and for all the many beyond the parish boundaries who are part of this fellowship. And we'll keep on doing that and we will tell you first if anything is going to change. Anyway, for now, back on with our service. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of the gift of God's grace, we can come freely into his presence even though we have sinned, though we've fallen short of what he has expected and asked of us, 
He offers us the opportunity to express our need for forgiveness, for grace, for strength, that we might experience his peace. And so we pause as we consciously enter the throne room of God. We reflect on his holiness, his power, his beauty, and we become aware of how much we need him. And so through the words of the confession which is on the screen, we express our need as we say this together. O oh Lord our God, you know us better than we know ourselves. As we come before you now, we all share a deep need, for we are all lost without your grace. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our troubled thoughts. Give us true repentance, forgive us all our wrongs, transform us by your Spirit to live for you each day, to love and serve each other, and through the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, to come at last to heaven. Amen. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though our sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for your cleansing. Thank you for the grace that is ours and the peace that you give us in forgiveness. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine and ten thousand beside. We sing together that great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Good morning. It's time now for our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning to say thank you for the many people who do not normally attend Christian gatherings in church buildings, but are tuning in to the many services on the internet. Thank you for making it possible to share the good news of Jesus and to express our praise and worship in this way for all to see. But Lord, help us to see the opportunities across the world and locally in this pandemic to find ways of reaching out, to build relationships with our communities and draw them into fellowship with you and your people. Thank you, Father. But here in the UK, the numbers affected by the virus are reducing. But help us all not to be complacent, as it could so easily revert to high numbers again. We pray for those who are shielding and have little or no contact with loved ones, like Gilda, who has been unable to physically see Ron in the nursing home. We ask that you bless all those in similar circumstances and uphold them, strengthen them and wrap your arms around them with your love and grace, giving them the patience to see the end of this pandemic. Lord, we pray to you for those struggling to cope with isolation, mental health issues, unemployment, loss of identity and purpose and seeking to understand why and what is the meaning of life and through all this we will see rise in compassion from your people prepared to reach out to others in a variety of ways. Thank you too Father for all those working in the front line and behind the scenes doing their best to treat people and to prevent people from contracting the virus often at great risk to themselves. Lord, for those who are breaking the lockdown rules and causing trouble in this land, forgive them and help us to be forgiving. Also make them realise their selfishness could cause so many problems for others. We also pray for the police, that you would supply them with the wisdom in how they handle these problems. We pray for the leaders of our country and give them the clarity and wisdom on making important decisions that affect us all. Father, we want to bring to you those in our own church family who are struggling with ill health and difficult circumstances. Make them aware of your presence and love in their lives. At the same time, we ask that you help Andrew and all involved in church preparation and children's work. Father, Jesus gave us a very important commission to go into all the world and proclaim the good news to everyone and that we are to be ready at all times to give the reason why Jesus is so important to us personally. And with that in mind, prepare the way ahead for each of us that we may be faithful to you and obedient to your call to us. Lord, we make these requests known to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, our friend, our brother, and ultimately our King. Amen. Now, let's all say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The reading is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 21 to 39. The words will appear on the screen. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. 
The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever had left her and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, which still lights up this world 2,000 years later. Father, please help me now to be clear and to teach rightly these eyewitness testimonies. And we pray, our Father, that we would see the real Jesus this, as we gather round his word. Amen. Last week, we begun to look at Mark's gospel. We looked at the first 15 verses. And one of the things we thought about is that Mark's gospel comes in two halves. You've got chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark gives the game away in the first sentence. In the middle, Peter says, you are the Christ. And at the end, or to near the very end, the centurion says, surely this man was the son of God when he sees how Jesus dies. It's a bit like a game of football or a football pitch. And in that first half, the big question is, who is Jesus? And in the second half, the big focus is on why has he come? There's bits of each in each half, but that's broadly speaking uh, how Mark's gospel works. And uh, if you're watching this, then you can see a picture of that on the screen, the football pitch, uh, the three people who say who Jesus is, Mark, Peter, and the centurion, and the two big questions. And so we saw last week that in chapter one, verses one to 15, Mark gives us really quick, punchy evidence. Isaiah, a great prophet from 700 years before Jesus. John the Baptist, whom Jesus later calls the greatest person ever before him. Satan, God's great enemy, and God the Father all say who Jesus is. It's an astonishing uh, list of testimony. The one thing that God and Satan agree on is who Jesus is. And he's proved by that to be God's king. And so the natural question, as we all read on through chapter one, was, well, what sort of king's he going to be? And we'll see that as we look at chapter one together this morning. I wonder if you ever played that game when you were growing up, or perhaps you still play it. King for a day, queen for a day, maybe you get to do it on your birthday. Uh, in our family, for example, on our children's birthdays, they get to choose what we have for dinner. Uh, it doesn't have to be a meal that makes sense to anybody else. If that's what they want for dinner, that's what we have for dinner. But imagine if you were king or queen for a day, what would you do? Normally when people ask me that, I, I say something like this. 
So if I was king for a day, I'd love to wake up to a really big, fat, full English, fry up everything on the plate, all the trimmings, gotta be fried potato in there, lots of buttered mushrooms, vast breakfast. And then with some good friends, I'd love to walk it off on a great big fell, so a great big walk most of the day, get home mid-afternoon, bit of a snooze, maybe read a book. If it's the summer, that's in the garden on a deck chair. If it's the winter, curled up around a log fire. And in the evening, a nice dinner party and not have to do any washing up. That would be a lovely thing, wouldn't it, to be king for a day. Now you might listen to that and think, golly, I'd do none of that. Well, I don't know what yours would be. If you were queen for the day, what would your perfect day be? And that gets us into Mark chapter one, because we've just seen some pretty compelling evidence that Jesus is God's only chosen king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. He's the king. And the big question then is, well, what sort of king's he going to be? What's he going to do? And particularly, that's going to matter for you and me. Is he the sort of king that I'd like to meet? Is he the sort of person I'd like to have in charge of my life? Or is he the sort of person that's going to take one look at someone like me and turn his face away? What sort of king is Jesus going to be? In other words, he's got all this authority. How's he going to use it? And to get into this passage, it's going to really help just to remember that in those days when people were writing um, in Greek in about 50 to 55 AD, uh, there were no such things as bold or underline or even paragraphs. They just wrote Greek letters sequentially. And so to work out what's going on, we can't look for bold or underline or paragraph markers. We can't look for great big stars and circles and clouds drawn around keywords. We have to look at the structure of the text. And this text is really carefully structured. Now, you may not have noticed as you read it through or as you listened just now, but if you were to read it four, five, six times through, you'd start to notice a few things. Uh, for example, in chapter 1, verse 16 to 20, Jesus is walking by the sea and he calls people to follow him. And in chapter 2, 13 and 14, does the same thing, walking by the sea and calls people to follow him. They're, they're what we call bookends. And just after that, in the sea, with the seaside call in 16 to 20, we have Jesus preaching or teaching at Capernaum, and there's a miracle that proves the power of his words. And just before the sea and the call in 2, 13 and 14, we have Jesus teaching in Capernaum, and there's a miracle that proves the power of his words. Those are big bookends, if you like, in this chunk of Mark's gospel. And that then means that all the bits in verses 29 to 45 are the filling in the sandwich. So we focus in on 29 to 45, and we notice that 29 to 45 has bookends itself because it's got Jesus with authority to heal, with authority to heal. And in the middle of that, we've got Jesus making a statement about his priority. I've come to teach, he says. I've come to teach. You can see that uh, in verse 38. Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So in those days, without highlighter pens and bold and underline, Mark still makes really clear in his structure what the focus of this passage is. And can you see that it's all about authority? We saw last week lots of evidence that Jesus is God's king. He's not just king for a day choosing dinner. He's king of the world forever. And we're going to see now how he uses that authority. He's got authority to call people to follow him. He's got authority to heal people. And he's got authority, most of all, to preach and teach God's truth. And there's lots of different things going on in the passage. I wonder if you noticed um, as you went through, uh, for example, you get the word immediately coming up time and again, don't you? Verse 18, verse 20, verse 21, verse 23, verse 29, verse 30. It's punchy, isn't it? Click, click. Click. Mark just keeps us going. Something happening all the time. You can't really snooze while you're reading Mark's gospel. It's half the size of the other gospels. And it's keeping going, isn't it? And again, lots of other repeated words. The word follow comes up time and again. Follow verse 17. Follow verse 18. Follow verse 20. At once verse 18. Without delay verse 20. And the teaching theme, very clear. Um, verse 21, verse 22, four times you get the word teach. So it's clearly all about authority, it's clearly punchy, and it's clearly about teaching. Let's just focus in on those three things then, shall we? The authority to call, the authority to heal, 
and the authority to preach. And if that's the focus, if Jesus has got that authority, it's really clear what it's going to mean for you and I. If he's got authority, then the call or the challenge for you and I is to recognise his authority, is to listen to his teaching. If he's the king, then we need to treat him as king. And that's a challenge for those of us who are already Christians to ensure that we treat Jesus king throughout the whole of our lives. And it's a challenge for those of us who perhaps might not want to call ourselves Christians to recognise that he is the king. Hopefully as we go through you'll see he's a brilliant king. Let's look then, first of all, the authority to call, verses 16 to 20. And there's something really surprising going on here. Jesus walks beside the Sea of Galilee and he sees Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets for their fishermen. And he says, follow me and I'll send you out to fish for people, verse 18. So they argued with him and said, not a really good time. Do do you realise how much money we've got invested in these boats? This is our livelihood. What's our father going to think of us who handed this down from his father and his father? What are we going to live on? Where are we going to live? And how long are we following you for again? A week, a couple of weeks? What do I need to pack? Is that what you see in verse 18? No, it's immediate, isn't it? They recognise Jesus' authority and they leave everything and they follow. And it happens again, verse 19. He goes a little further and he sees James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in their boat preparing their nets. Without delay, they too follow him. And they left their father Zebedee with his hired men and went. Jesus' authority to call is absolute. And our response should be immediate. Once you and I are convinced who Jesus is, The temptation is to keep vacillating. In golf, you call it waggling on the tee. Don't waggle on the tee. Take the shot. If you're convinced who Jesus is, start following him. Today's a great day to do that. Do it immediately. He's got that authority. And so he calls people. And it's brilliant that he does so. Okay, we'll see why, because he's the king of the kingdom. He's got authority to call, absolute authority. He's also got authority to heal. It's utterly gorgeous, isn't it, to read these verses. Verse 21, there he is teaching uh, in Capernaum, in the synagogue, and the people are amazed, verse 22, at his teaching. It's utterly amazing. What are they amazed at? Verse 22, his authority. He taught them as one who had authority, not like the teachers of the law. And then there's a man who's got an impure spirit. Now, you might have questions about that at this point, and you might have questions about the healings too. They're very natural questions. They're really good and right questions to ask. Many today are very sceptical about the sort of miracles we read in the Gospels. Wasn't this just undiagnosed schizophrenia? Why do you you attribute everything to evil spirits when it could so easily have been natural? Well, those are difficult questions. And as we read through Mark's Gospel, we can keep asking them because some of the healings and some of the miracles can't have been faked. I mean, in chapter 3, you meet a man with a crippled hand and you don't need a degree in medicine to recognise a crippled hand. So some of these you might have questions about, but you can't question all of them. Miracles like calming a storm. I mean, a storm is either calmed or it isn't. We'll see that in chapter 4. But more importantly, one of the Gospels was written by a doctor, Dr Luke. And he quotes Mark's gospel extensively. And this doctor was convinced by these medical miracles. Perhaps more importantly still, when we read about impure spirits and a spiritual realm, let's not forget that Satan's already revealed himself. In verse 13 of chapter 1, Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. Because Jesus is God's great king, and Jesus is going to beat Satan and break death, once and for all. Of course, Satan and his angels, his demons, are going to attack Jesus. Of course, they're going to be more engaged when God's king is on the battleground. Why don't we see it so much today? Well, because God's king is not physically on the battleground today. And the final just observation as you read this through Mark's gospel, I don't know if it struck you as you were reading it this week, but did you notice what people were amazed by? They weren't amazed by the miracle. Have a look there. Verse 27. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching 
and with authority he even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. In other words, the miracle made people marvel at Jesus' words. So if you and I are impressed by these miracles, and we should be, then that should make us read on in Mark's Gospel and listen to Jesus' words. Authority to call, authority to heal, but most of all, authority to preach. Right in the middle of that sandwich I described for you earlier is verses 35 to 39. You get two lovely moments there, don't you? You get very early in the morning, Jesus escaping and leaving the house. He'd have to do that, wouldn't he? Because the whole countryside's been coming there. Can you imagine? This man's healing everybody. Well, you'd be bringing anybody you knew that needed healing along, wouldn't you? So very early, Jesus gets up and escapes, and he goes to a solitary place, and he prays. I think of this verse often in my Christian life. If Jesus needed to pray, how much more do I? How much more do we? But then he says something very important in the middle of all this. He says, verse 38, let's go somewhere else. You can see that his followers are saying, this is amazing, everyone looking for you. You're famous, you're trending on Twitter. Would you believe it? Let's crack on, this is, this is going to go big. And Jesus says, no, no. Verse 38, let's go somewhere else. Let's go to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That's why I have come. Now, we can't read this verse and say Jesus' only priority is preaching, not healing. That doesn't make sense of Mark's Gospel because we're going to see Jesus doing huge numbers of healings as we go through Mark's Gospel. But what we can say is that the preaching and the healing are linked, and we see that in chapter 1, don't we? Jesus casts out the evil spirit in chapter 1, and the people listen to his teaching. And Jesus is teaching about a kingdom. The kingdom of God has come near, he said in verse 15. Repent and believe the good news. What's the kingdom going to be like? Well, it's going to be this kingdom of healing. It's going to be a kingdom without death or mourning or crying or pain, as we learn later on in the Bible. Jesus is giving a thumbnail sketch of the kingdom, and he's proving what sort of king he is. Authority to call, authority to heal, and authority to preach and teach, and a priority of doing that, which is combined with all sorts of other things as the gospel goes on, including very many healings. What does that leave then for you and for me? Well, if he's got authority to call, then we need to hear. And we need to be clear that the call is to be willing to leave everything. We'll see that right in the middle of the gospel. If anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Or in chapter one, or just, just leave, your, leave your business and follow. Many Christians, like myself, find that an ongoing struggle that we pray into because the call to follow Jesus has been the call to leave everything behind or to be willing to for the sake of following him. Authority to call, let's listen. Authority to heal, Let's be amazed at the power of Jesus and listen carefully to those words of great power. Let's read on in Mark's Gospel. And authority to preach, to teach the truth. Let's listen carefully as Jesus teaches God's truth. What's Jesus like then as a king? Well, I wonder what you thought of my king for the day, day. A big fry up, a nice fell walk, a snooze and a book, and a big dinner. I'm not sure I blessed anybody else very much through my day, did I? Very nice day for Andrew Towner. Was it a nice day for you when I was king for a day? When Jesus is king, everyone's blessed. Jesus combines great authority with great compassion. When you read through Mark's Gospel, you'll see that Jesus doesn't do pointless miracles. He does purposeful and compassionate miracles. Jesus could, for example, have just clicked his fingers and made Mount Rushmore with his own face on it. But that wouldn't have helped anybody. It would have proved his authority, but it wouldn't have shown his compassion. Instead, he heals people. He could have just done a quick solar eclipse, or maybe turned stones into bread, but they wouldn't have helped people. Jesus uses his authority, combined with great love and compassion, to help people. Jesus is the king, and he's the most compassionate and loving king you could ever hope for. That's the king. 
And this is the snapshot of the kingdom that Jesus calls us into. What a brilliant kingdom, defined by the brilliant king. Seen here in Mark 1 as a thumbnail sketch, seen fully one day, I humbly suggest to you that Jesus as a king is much better than Andrew Towner as king for a day. He is the real king. And after reading chapter one, who wouldn't want to be in his kingdom? Why not join today? Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, we pray for those listening who are already Christians and ask that you help us to follow Jesus more and more perfectly, more and more fully, more and more completely each day. Help us to marvel at him. Help us to love him. Help us to submit ourselves to him. Help us to immediately do all he asks of us. And Father, we pray for those who are still thinking these things through perhaps deciding whether Jesus is really true, perhaps deciding whether or not to follow him. Father, we pray for those people to see clearly not only the truth of Jesus King, but the glory and the wonder and the beauty of Jesus King. So for all of us, we pray, Father, that you help us to follow Jesus, recognising his authority. And we pray that in Jesus' own name. Amen. As we come to the end of our time together, uh, why not capture a thought, write it down, uh, text a friend, turn to someone you're listening in with. Why not reflect on what we've heard? And thank you so much to those who've been in touch during the week with questions and thoughts and comments from last week. It's really encouraging. And it's great to work harder understanding Mark's gospel as we study it together. So please do feel most free. Uh, to ping those through on Facebook or on, on the phone or through email or whatever works best for you. Let's keep encouraging each other and reflecting on what we've heard from Mark's Gospel this morning.